Amen. Well, good morning, 10 o'clock service. You doing okay today? Yes, it is good to see you. I am super excited to be together. I love this series on parenting. I love it because it includes all of us. It's because each of us have young people in our lives, people that we care about investing in, people that uh, we want to see their potential come out of. Like We want to see them become the fullest of who God had made them, intended them to be. So I want you to lean in, whether you are a parent, you've got, maybe you've got little tiny babies, or maybe your, your kids are teenage, crazy, or, you know, crazy years right now. Maybe, maybe you're a grandparent, maybe you're a friend, you've got a roommate, you've got somebody that you care about investing in, and, and we have an opportunity as a church to start to believe something significant about them. Here's what I, I love. As a church, we are committed and passionate about people's potential. When we look at the next generation, we, we believe that God is, is calling us and inviting us into an, an equipping really season and a releasing season and a, and a place for these guys to, this next generation to be raised up to their full potential. I, I really believe the next generation is waiting for somebody like you and I to, to develop them, to invest in them, to get them ready for all that God has created them for and preparing them for. Here, here's an assumption that happens, though, I think, in our lives. When it comes to the, the impact of the next generation, today I want to talk to you about how to build for impact. When it comes to the impact of the next generation, I, I think we accidentally make an assumption that they got to wait a little while. they got to get a little smarter, a little bigger, a little faster, a little less annoying, whatever it is, right? We, we make these assumptions. I, I think about the next generation, and, and, and we're, we're trying to wait for them to get into school at this spot or, or, or maybe when, when they get to this age. I remember when our girls were first young, and, and, and they're learning how to walk, and I was like, oh, I can't wait till they can run. And then as they were running, I can't wait till they can, you know, kick a soccer ball. And then as they kick a soccer ball, I can't wait till they're like, you know, playing at this high level of soccer, you know. And it's like there's always this like next thing that we're anticipating or waiting for, or hoping that happens. And, and that assumption of like life will be different than their impact will be different than their, their, their abilities will be different than misses out on the opportunities we have now to see them built for the impact that God has called them to and, and, and invited them into. I don't want to make an assumption that eliminates the opportunity for the next generation. I don't think any of us do. We don't want to like, shove our kids to the sidelines and just ask them to get a little bit older and then they can do something awesome for the kingdom. We believe that right now is the time for the next generation to be designed and, 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 and shaped and, and put together for the purpose of God in their lives. It's not a time to wait. It's a time to release. And I really believe that this is a pivotal conversation today. And so I want to dive right into it. You want to dive in with me today? Yeah. All right. Grab your Bible. Turn to John chapter six. It's a, it's a gospel in the new Testament. Chapter six, feeding of the 5,000 is what I want to, I want to kind of land us there today. Give you a couple of kind of shapes of theology just to help you understand kind of how I think about the next generation from God's word. In Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says, you are God's masterpiece. Why does he say this to them? Because God sees every human in creation that he's created as perfect, as somebody that he meant to be that way, somebody that he wants to use for his purposes. He says, when you were created anew in Christ Jesus, the moment you, you gave your heart to Jesus, the moment you said yes to his leadership, the moment you surrendered to his spirit and his call and his, his leadership in your life is the moment that his spirit came to dwell inside you, sealing you for the day of salvation. And now you and I have the Spirit of God inside of us, shaping us for the purpose of God. He said, you are his masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus, so that, I love that word, so that, so that you could do the good works that God planned long ago for you to do. When I think about our kids, I think about them as these masterpieces that God is creating anew, that he is, that he is reviving to life, that he is bringing out of death into life. Man, we don't, we don't baptize babies around here because we really believe that the next generation coming up needs to make this decision to surrender themselves to Jesus. And we as parents have a huge part in, in that, in playing and in, in helping them uh, become who God made them to be. As they are renewed in Jesus, as they surrender to Jesus, baptized into Jesus, then now the Spirit of God is going, all right, now you're ready to, to do the good works that I planned long ago for you to do. When we look at the next generation, we look at them the way God looks at them, as his masterpiece with a purpose that he is shaping them for. Amen? We don't, we don't look at them as somebody that we got to kind of tolerate and, and, and wait till they're older, till they're awesome. You know, like, like right now, 
God wants to do something miraculous in our kids, through our kids, through the next generation. The assumptions that we kind of have when it comes to the next generation, well, they're not old enough, they're not strong enough, they're not smart enough, they're not gifted enough, they're, they're just not there yet, Richie. I believe in them, but it's just not yet. That box that we put around the next generation, I really believe limits the opportunities that they have to be used by God for the miraculous, impossible things that some of us have only dreamt of seeing God do. He sees them as his masterpiece. He also sees them. I love Psalm 127. I love how God sees our kids. Children, they're a gift from the Lord. Grandparents could probably say amen to that, right? Uh, <laughs> current parents are like, ah, maybe, you know, a gift to shape all the uh, uh, selfishness out of me, right? A gift to uh, refine all the uh, imperfections inside of this person. But, but a, children are a gift from the Lord, the psalmist writes. They are a reward from him. I love that language. God's like, hey, I got something special for you. I want to I celebrate you. I want to bless you. I want to honor you. Here you go. Here's a, here's a little one. Here's one that's going to be used by God in miraculous ways. And you're going to get to be a part of building the impact that I have in their life into them. You get to be a part of something miraculous in this reward that I'm giving you, this gift that I'm giving you. He says, children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. Think of this picture. This is, this is the psalmist going, hey, here's a room full of warriors. We're a church that's becoming a church for the city, that we want to have an impact for all of eternity in our city. We're not content to just kind of play religious games and go through religious motion. We actually want to see God do something miraculous in our day, in our city, through us as a people. And so, so we, we view ourselves the way the psalmist is writing about us as warriors. People are going to make an impact in, for the kingdom of God in our city. He said, hey, I want to give you some weapons of warfare. I'm going to give you an arrow. I'm going to give you an arrow that was intended for a target, right? Like an arrow has no use on a shelf. It's not really that cool to look at. An arrow, an arrow has no use just stuck in your quiver. But an arrow that's, that actually is being launched toward the target that it was aimed at, the target that it was built for, the impact that it was made. Man, that's something miraculous. He says, these are what kids are. They are they're children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. Here's what I hear the Lord saying. Have lots of babies, right? Like if your quiver is full, man, you're going to be full of joy. <laughs> I love that verse. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will be, not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. And when I hear this, God's saying, hey, I got a gift for you, real life. It's your kids. They're not your possession. Just kind of to sideline and, and, and sit there and, and, and hope that they don't mess up too bad. And I've got a gift for you that, that I want you to, to launch toward their impact that I built them for, towards the target, the destination that I built for their lives. These are your children. They're a gift. They're a blessing. They're a reward. I want to honor you through the children that, that you're going to launch toward the impact that I've built them for. God sees them as a masterpiece. He sees them as these arrows that are going to be launched. And, and I, I love how Jesus launched his original disciples. And Matthew, uh, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to skip ahead in, in my head to Acts chapter 4. There's these guys that... Um, were trained by Jesus for three years. Most of the disciples, most scholars say they were in their teen age years as Jesus was raising them up to be used by him. He gave them a small mission. I want you to go make disciples of all nations. Go change the world. Can you imagine entrusting this tiny little mission to teenage boys? Hey, I want you to go change the world real quick. Hey, hey, while you're at it, I want you to make disciples of every nation. I want you to baptize them. I want you to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. I think of the Savior of the world. He could have planned any strategy he wanted to, and he gathered this ragtag group of guys together, spent three years investing in their lives, and he said, go change the world. Go do what I've done with you for the last three years. Go do it. One person at a time, I want you to see this, this world change through you. I mean, when the, 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 the teachers, the religious leaders uh, uh, in the first century saw these disciples, Peter and John, when they saw them healing guys and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, they called them in because they're mad. They're like, hey, we thought we squished this rebellion called Jesus. We thought we killed him. We thought this was over with. And now you keep preaching Jesus and, and, and we want you to shut up. And the San, this Sanhedrin, this council, they were amazed, Acts 4.13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men. 
Man, I think one of the, the, the fears that we have as parents and grandparents is what if our kids are ordinary? Like, what if they don't stand out in the crowd? What if they're not first picked for the team? What if they don't have the highest grades in the school? What if they don't, you know, kind of, you know, rise above the cream of all of this? You know, like, what if my kids are kind of normal? The good news that I love in this passage is, is these were the guys that Jesus chose to change the world. The ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. And they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Man, the thing that marked the disciples of Jesus, the ones that were changing the world, not only their youth, their no special training, but their, their passionate pursuit of Jesus' presence. These were men that clearly had been with Jesus. And I think about us building into the lives of, of the next generation, the impact that God has built them for. Man, the assumption could be so dangerous for us as a church. We could accidentally minimize the next generation. Because we got to do our church thing in here and we should just send them over to these classrooms and just kind of, kind of just, you know, pacify them for an hour while we do our church thing in here. We could accidentally, in, in our connect groups, we could just kind of put them in the basement and hope that they don't make too much noise while we have a real spiritual conversation upstairs. We could, we could accidentally minimize the impact that God has built these young ones for if we don't see them the way God sees them as a gift, as an arrow, as an opportunity to see this, this city change, this world change. Man, I was challenged. I was reading this book recently. And the author is a, is a pastor who, who's trying to kind of rattle the cages, I think, of, of the American church. And he says, my friend Jen leads a ministry that currently disciples over 250,000 children in Africa on a weekly basis. It's quite the ministry, yeah? These children actually go to unreached people groups. These children heal the sick. These children preach the gospel. These are kids. Last year, 2017, these children shared the gospel with 169 unreached people groups. Kids. They're sharing the gospel in places where adult missionaries have been killed for trying to spread the gospel. There are stories of God doing things through them we could never imagine him doing through us. Jen tells me of how these kids went into a village where there was great spiritual darkness. Children in the village died mysteriously every week, and no one could figure out why. Listen, these kids fearlessly stayed in the village and prayed for hours. The entire situation lifted because of their prayers, and children in the village stopped dying mysterious deaths. Many in the village were led to Jesus by these kids. There are many other stories of children going in simple faith to heal animists and Muslims in the name of Jesus. Don't you find it a bit discouraging that these kids are transforming villages in Africa while our kids are watching puppet shows on Jonah and learning songs with hand motions? It's kind of a pointed question. Are you sure that this is what we have to settle for in, in the church because of our geographic location? It could be that we have been, could it be that we have been wasting our most precious resource? It could be that we have been treating our greatest assets as obligations. We need to start reminding our children of their power, he says. Maybe it's our lack of expectation from younger kids that bleeds into the way we treat middle school kids in the church. We teach them as if their only goal is to refuse to drink or to have sex. And then when they hit high school, we try to entertain them enough to keep them coming. We can keep doing things the way we've always done them, but maybe we need to do some more releasing and less taming. What would happen if we trained our young lions to attack rather than to keep them sheltered? Maybe it's time we obey Jesus' words and set ourselves in the posture of learning from our kids. See, this assumption was flipped on its ear by Jesus himself. The book of Matthew Jesus was teaching to the crowds and people started to bring their kids to get blessed by Jesus. And, and, and the disciples thought, hey, this is a religious kind of spiritual moment. Don't interrupt it with the young ones. And so they started shooing the parents and the kids away. Jesus stopped them. He said, no, 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 hang on a second. I want you to let these little kids come to me. I want to pray over them. I want to bless them. I want to lay my hands on them. And he didn't stop there. He said to the adults, the big people in the room, he said, actually, unless you become like them, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. So, so, so hang on a second, Jesus. When, when we're waiting for kids to become like us before they could be used by you, you're saying, no, no, no. You actually need to become like them if you're going to be used by me. Wow, this conversation. It could get really kind of interesting real quick, I think, for us if we go, 
My assumption has been that they need to be big enough and old enough and smart enough and get through all of these things before they could be used by God. What if God wants to release our kids into our city to be a, be, a, be a statement for us, a testimony to us of like how little faith we have and how much courage they have? Like, What if God wants to use our kids to challenge us to get busy with the mission of God? We've got all these careers and all this stuff cluttering our lives. They, got, they just got what they got at this point, right? Like, what if God wanted to release them to, to show us, to make a statement to us about what's possible in our city? And I watch, I watch one of my girls fearlessly right now sharing her faith with one of her friends who's far from God. And I didn't teach her, like, how to do that. I didn't, like, sit down with her and give her, like, the, the little methods that I use to help people understand who Jesus is. She's just asking questions and loving her friend, and her friend's asking her questions back, and there's opportunities and doors opening up, relationship is strengthening. How did Jesus build for impact into his disciples' lives? That's really the question, right, Richie? I I get it. Okay, my my kids have an impact. Our kids have an impact that God has built them for. How do we build for impact into their lives? This is John chapter 6, that scripture I told you to turn to like 20 minutes ago, right? You with me still? All right. John 6, Jesus is feeding the 5,000 people. Well, the the disciples didn't know what Jesus was up to. They didn't know that he was going to feed the 5,000 people because they see 5,000 men plus women and children, maybe 10,000, 15,000 people walking over the hill hungry. The disciples' idea is, Lord, we should send them away. Let's get rid of these guys. There they go again, shooing people off, right? And Jesus going, no, I want you to give them something to eat. He says it to Philip. Philip, where are we going to get bread to buy, buy, you know, buy enough bread for these people? And Philip's like, Lord, I have no idea. I mean, there's no money. There's no, no, there's no way we could, we could help these people get the food that they need. Here's what I love, what Jesus is doing. Like, if you're going, how, Richie, do I build for impact? Here's what he's doing. He's creating a moment of, for exposure in, in his disciples' lives. He's exposing them to a place where they've got to depend on him, where they've got to kind of step outside of themselves. They're out, out of their depth. Like, think about, like, our parenting strategy is keep them in their depth. Keep them in their, kind of, like, their safe spots. Keep them in places where they're not going to get hurt or where they're not going to get exposed to hard stuff or difficult things. Let's protect them at all costs. And I I really believe that. I'm passionate about protecting my girls. I absolutely am. But, like, what if God wanted to to, to share with them kind of opportunities to depend on him in in ways that they couldn't get if we just kind of coddle them and keep them kind of protected from the big, bad world? And I, I, I mean... Man, you could look at all kinds of different strategies and we could talk about all kinds of different schools and education types. And what I'm just saying is at the core of it, like the way Jesus got his disciples ready to change the world was gave them moments of exposure where they had to depend on God. I mean, it could be simple, right? It doesn't have to be like maybe you, you go on a mission trip around the world. That would, that's one way to do it. Maybe you go serve at our One Heart Center. Maybe you go cook dinner for a bunch of kids with your kids. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just something simple like, hey, Christmas is coming, and, and we've got all these Christmas Eve services coming up. What if, like kids, what if we could pray for one of our families in our neighborhood together and, and, and believe that God's going to do something miraculous, and we can bring them with us to Christmas? What if you could just create a moment where dependent on God is something that's in the equation, not just dependent on ourselves and our, and our ways and kind of our resources. Like we're, we're intentionally stepping out of our depth together and, and, and trusting that God is going to have to do something miraculous. And I just think about like what happens when, when you and I create these moments for exposure. One of the kids in our kids' ministry here, um, just five weeks ago, Grayson and the team did like a whole like invite Sunday and they give away prizes. And if you bring friends, here's opportunities and all kinds of fun. You know, kids love all that stuff. And it was so cool because one little boy, I don't remember how old he was, elementary age boy, invited over 15 friends to be with him on Sunday. All of them actually ended up saying no. But the team was so blown away by the amount of work that this little boy did to bring people with him on, on a Sunday. I just think about like, like these moments where kids are out of their depth, what it teaches them, what kind of things happen to them in these places of faith and exposure. The other thing that Jesus is doing here in John chapter 6, you could write this down, is he was creating moments for empowerment. He was creating moments for empowerment. What do I mean? Well, 
But look at what happens. I, I love. So he, he takes the five loaves and the two fish. He prays. He breaks the bread and distributes it. And 5,000 people plus women and children eat and are full, by the way. It's miraculous what happens there. And then he says to his disciples, hey, hey, everyone was full. Jesus told the disciples, verse 12, 13, he says, hey, gather, uh, gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scrap left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. I want you to think about this moment. 12 baskets. There's 12 disciples. Think about each one of those disciples carrying this massive basket of leftovers. We only had five loaves and two fish, and and 5,000 men plus women and children just ate. They're full. And here I'm carrying this basket of leftovers. There's this moment of empowerment where Jesus is going, hey, look look at what I can do through you. As they're picking up all the leftovers, you imagine the weight of the basket growing and growing as the disciples pick up more and more leftovers and they're carrying them back to Jesus. You imagine what's being seared in their hearts and their minds that God, the God of the universe is at, at work here. God is doing something miraculous here and, and I got to just be a part of it. I, I'm a part of it by carrying this basket and seeing what God is up to. Like what a miraculous thing for the disciples to be exposed to in this moment. And when I think about us as a church, like there's something that, that God wants to show us. And in a second, we're going we're gonna to get to pray over our kids. We're going to actually commission our kids here in a moment. We'll bring them in. It's probably going to get all noisy, but it's going to be awesome, right? We're not going to just shove them over somewhere. We're going to actually like focus on them for a second. But think about what, what God might be saying to us as a church. Think about what, what might be happening in our hearts right now. Something might be shifting for us, pivoting as a church that we, 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 we don't just tolerate the next generation or view them as an obligation like that guy writes, but that we actually see them as our responsibility to prepare them for the impact that God has built them for. You've got grandkids. And sometimes all we pray for in our grandkids, right, is just that God would keep them safe. But safe is great, but what if, what if God wants to do something miraculous through them? Sometimes we just need to expand like what we're believing for. Like as a church, I really believe that's part of what's at play here is is that God wants to expand our, kind of our ask, right? That our kids would not not just turn out okay, but that they would be the ones that change the world. Like it's so tempting, isn't it, to just pray these kind of prayers that are just kind of safe and like, oh God, help them to be awesome and help them to get good grades on their tests and help them to, you know, make that team or whatever it is. And those are amazing things, but just like, what if God wanted to elevate our hearts and our perspective and our faith and say, Hey, we're like, let's believe that God wants to do something miraculous through the next generation. And then it's our role. It's our job to build into them the impact that God has created them for that we can create actual moments of exposure where they've got to apply faith into their life. We could create moments of, of, of empowerment where they're in the middle of the miracle with us. They're not on the sideline. They're actually right in the middle of it with us, seeing God do miraculous things through us, carrying the basket with us. Like God just showed up in our lives. Like when was the last time you invited your kids in to have a discussion about some hard things that are going on or some places where you need to like believe God for something impossible together? Man, what a, what a powerful moment to, to, to make failure an okay thing because we're stepping out in faith. We're not, we're not just kind of like trying to play it safe all the time. Like we want to see these kids grow toward their potential as a church. And so we're committed, aren't we? We're committed to build for impact. Make sure those guys come in. Yeah, bring them in. When I think about what Jesus did in Matthew chapter 19. Let me just read you this. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. You're bothering the teacher. This is a religious moment, right? Teacher's got something important to say, so we're going to let him say it. But Jesus said, no, 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 let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. Like these ones right here. I love that Jesus didn't shoo them away, but Jesus brought them into the middle and made them the center of the conversation. And he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them before he left. That's what I want to do right now. Look at all these guys.
And when I look up here at you guys, I see an army that God is raising up. I see people that Jesus believes in massively. God knows you by name. He knows what he's built you for. He, he knows exactly how he's created you. He knows all the stuff you're awesome at and all the stuff you're horrible at. He knows how, how much you love people, how much hurt you've gone through. He knows every bit of your life. And he wants to take all of that and begin to use you for his purposes. You don't got to wait. You don't got to wait till you're old like me. Or like these people out here. You don't got to wait to be old. You can start right now being used by God. You can start today. I wonder what Jesus would say to you if you asked him to be used by him. What would God maybe speak to your heart and say, hey, here's a friend I want you to pray for. Here's somebody I want you to bring with you to church. I wonder what God would say to you if you just said, hey, I want to be used by you, God. Speak to me. I really believe God would speak to you. He would show you his plans, his purposes for your life. And he would give you steps to take. He would give you steps of obedience to take. Here's what I love is every time you obey Jesus, man, it gets simpler and more clear what he's asking you to do. It's not this big, hard, confusing thing. It's really simple. When Jesus speaks, we obey. As a church, I want you to hear this. Paul wrote this to a young man that he was getting ready for ministry. In 1 Timothy 4, he says, Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Hear me on this, kids. Don't let anybody think less of you because you are young. But be an example. Be an example to us. Be an example with your, your life. And what you say, the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Be an example. Your age doesn't hinder what God could do through you. God wants to start doing something miraculous in you right now. So we want you to hear this, kids. That we as a church, we believe in you. We're going to invest in you. We are for you. We want to bless you. We want to open doors of opportunity for you. We want to see you grow we want to see you lead the way in our, in, our, in our city, in our schools. God is going to use you in miraculous ways, and so we're going to pray over you. You good if we pray over you? All right. Adults, would you guys kind of put your hands towards these kids up here? We're just going to pray the way Jesus prayed over these young ones. God, you see a generation being raised up right here. You see young ones, God, that you have called, that you are anointing, God, that you have purpose for. God, you see young people right here, God, that you want to use to change the world, God. God, whatever fears, whatever hurts, whatever pain, God, is in their hearts, God, I pray that you'd be the healer. God, you would be the hope. You would be the peace, God, that every one of these kids needs. God, you would be the source of life for these kids. I pray for salvation for every single one of these kids, God. The courage to follow you no matter what. The courage to trust you no matter what. The courage to step out in faith no matter what, God. I pray that your spirit would just anoint these kids for your purposes, God. We as a church are committed, God, to raise them up, to lift them up, to give them opportunities to lead, to give them opportunities to love to give them an opportunity to set an example, God. I pray that you would use them to challenge us, to encourage us, God. These are the next generation of your church, Jesus, and we believe, God, that you are going to use them. And so we commission them now, God, and we ask you to open doors miraculously of opportunity and favor ahead of them, God, that every one of them would have something miraculous to step into and be used by you, God. We trust you with the impact of this next generation, God. We love you, and we commission them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen. Put your hands together, church, for this next generation of you guys. Give it up as these guys make their way out. We love the next generation. And some of you are being compelled. You need to obey Jesus today. He's calling you to get baptized. He's calling you to get connected to a group. Whatever your next step is, I want to challenge you to take that today. This is a time for us to respond to God's leading in your life. And these kids, they're setting an example for us. And I believe that God is going to use them to continue to encourage us. Their faith, their courage, 
is going to be a testimony to us. I pray that God uses them in each of our lives. Let's be a people who believe in the impact of the next generation. If you need to be baptized today, head to the back. Our team will meet you right back there. Right now, we've got everything you need to take that step today. If you need prayer about anything, some of our pastors, leaders, elders will be right up front. Team, would you come forward so we can pray? As we sing, let's worship, let's respond. Let's get baptized. Let's come forward for prayer. Love you a ton, real life. Let's respond to God today. Come on.